Look, there's one story in the Old Testament that, if I'm honest with you, I, I consider it the most disturbing of the entire Bible and could very well be considered inappropriate for minors. So before we continue with this video, it's crucial that you're fully aware that its content is not suitable for all ages, and this story can completely shake your faith. The story I'm referring to is found in chapters 19 to 21 of the Book of Judges. Many people know chapter 19, but not the rest of the story. I believe there are several important lessons that you and I need to learn from such a disturbing story. First, I'll tell you the story as dramatically as possible, and then I'll explore the lessons that I think we can learn together. But before we get to our video, please subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell so that YouTube can inform you when we upload the next videos. If my memory serves me correctly, in Judges chapter 19, in the days when there was no king in Israel, a Levite who lived in a remote part of the mountainous region of Ephraim acquired a woman from Bethlehem in Judah as his concubine. I want you to understand that here is a Levite man living in the northern part of Israel, and he acquires this woman to be his concubine or wife, as you wish to call her. She's living in the south, in Bethlehem. Let's continue the story. She was unfaithful to him and left him for her father's house in Bethlehem in Judah, where she stayed for four months. She betrayed him and returned to her father's house in Bethlehem. Then the story continues. This man, in search of redemption, longs to regain his wife. So he undertakes a journey from the north of the mountainous region to the south towards Bethlehem with the purpose of reclaiming the beloved woman and restoring their union. Upon reaching the destination, he encounters the warm hospitality of her father. On several occasions, he expresses his urgency, saying, I need to leave. Return my wife to me so I can return home. However, the stubborn father, in his generosity, insists, No, don't leave tonight. Stay with us a while longer. He said, Okay, I'll stay one more night. And this repeats for several days, until finally the man says with all respect, I appreciate your hospitality, but I need to go. I need to return home. So he finally sets off back home with his concubine. And that's when all the tragedy occurs. Well, the man is with his concubine traveling from Bethlehem in the south of Israel to the north in Ephraim. They were near Jebus, and the day was almost over. The servant said to his master, Please, why don't we stop in this city, Jebus, and spend the night? But his master replied, we're not going to stop in a foreign city where there are no Israelites. We'll continue to Jeba. So his servant said, Let's try to reach one of these places and spend the night in Jeba or Rama. So they continued their journey, and the sun set as they approached Gibeon in Benjamin. When they arrived there, they were surprised because no one was there to receive them into their homes. Hospitality, which was a huge thing in Israelite culture, in the late hours, an old man appeared in the square and asked why they were still here. They explained that no one had welcomed them, and the old man offered them lodging. The Levite and his servant, after being invited, spent the night at this man's house in Gibeah. However, while they were enjoying their stay, suddenly wicked men from the city surrounded the house. They knocked on the door and said to the homeowner, the old man, to bring out the guest so they could have sexual relations with him. Oh, my friend, it's at this point that the plot plunges into darkness with the entry of these wicked men from Gibeah, Benjamites, Lascivious, coveting the guest of the old man. Their relentless insistence adds a palpable tension involving the narrative in a veil of obscurity and unease. The homeowner, confronted with this situation, goes out and says, Please, don't do this wickedness, my brothers. After all, this man came to my house. Don't commit this horrendous atrocity here. Let me bring my virgin daughter and the concubine of the man. Abuse them and do whatever you want with them, but don't commit this outrageous thing against this man. We'll deal with it a bit later in this video. But what happens next is unthinkable. It says in verse 25 that the man refused to listen. So he took his concubine and took her outside where they raped and abused her all night until dawn. At dawn, they let her go. Now, my friend, 
This is why I said this video may be considered inappropriate for minors and may completely shake your faith. I want you to imagine here is a group of perverted men taking turns having sexual relations with this woman. When one finished, another began raping her all night until dawn when they finally let her go. That's what happened to this poor young woman. In the early morning, the woman returns, and as it dawned, she collapses at the door of the man's house. You can imagine she's so worn out, beaten, and abused all night by these men that she barely has the strength to crawl back to this man's house and simply collapses on the porch. Notice what happens next. It says here that when her master got up in the morning, opened the doors of the house, and went out to continue his journey, there was the woman, his concubine, collapsed near the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, let's go. But there was no response. The woman had been abused and had died. It says here that the man put her on his donkey and went home. What happens next is very sad and horrible. When he entered his house, he took a knife, held his concubine, cut her into 12 pieces, limb by limb, and then sent throughout the territory of Israel to the 12 tribes. Everyone who saw this said, nothing like this has ever happened or been seen since the day the Israelites came out of the land of Egypt until now. Think about it. I'll discuss how this man took his concubine home, cut her into 12 pieces, and undoubtedly attached a letter to each piece of her deceased body. He sent a different piece of her body to the 12 tribes of Israel with a letter recounting exactly what had been done by their own brothers from one of the 12 tribes of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. When these other tribes saw and read what had happened to this woman, they said, nothing like this has ever happened throughout our history. There's much more in the story in chapters 20 and 21. So I want you to wait. But this is where I want to start looking at some lessons we can learn from this. And the first one is this. When there's no accountability in our lives, we have a strong tendency to deviate. In chapters 19 to 21, it's the climax in the city of God, showing how far the nation as a whole has drifted from God. And my friend, you and I are no different because if we don't have a connection with God, we drift away from Him. We deviate from God, just like the Israelites, finding ourselves doing things that someone 10 years ago would tell us we would do, and we'd be convinced we'd never do those things. There's no way I'd get divorced. There's no way I'd have an affair. There's no way I'd get fired from my job because they found me watching something online. There's no way I'd be smoking marijuana or whatever it may be. The further you drift from God, the more vulnerable you become to committing sin. The story doesn't end in chapter 19. I wish it did, but it actually gets worse. What happens now in chapter 21 is a civil war between the 11 tribes of Israel fighting against the tribe of Benjamin because it's the tribe of Benjamin that committed this heinous act of sin against one of their own Israelite brothers. I encourage you to read in detail chapters 20 and 21. But to summarize, a huge battle occurred resulting in the loss of thousands of lives on both sides. In the end, only 600 Benjamite men remained. In chapter 21, the other 11 tribes start to feel sorry for the tribe of Benjamin because they're concerned about the future of this tribe since there are only 600 men left with no women for them to marry and procreate. Now, they have another problem as they're concerned about one of their 12 tribes of Israel going extinct. This leads to my fourth lesson. Every bad decision we make has consequences that we cannot choose. Although what these Benjamites did was wrong, the decision of the other 11 tribes to fight and kill was a decision they made and now they have to pay for the outcome of that decision, and the Benjamites also have to pay for the result of their bad decision. You can choose your sin, but you can't choose your consequences. Every decision you make has consequences, and the problem is personal. You and I can choose these kinds of consequences. So what happens is these Israelites go and kill men from this clan called Jabez Gilead, and the 400 women who had never been with a man. They take these 400 women, and give them to 400 of the 600 Benjamite men for them to procreate. The problem is simple mathematics. 
There were 600 Benjamite men who couldn't find wives because all the wives were murdered. Now 400 of them have a wife given to them from the Jabes clan of Gilead. The problem is that now there are 200 Benjamite men who have no wife. And that's why I said one bad decision often leads to another. Because what happens next is these leaders basically say, you know what? We all made an oath and said, we couldn't give our daughters to any of the Benjamites, but it doesn't say anything about if they're taken. So what happens is, they have to make another bad decision and say, hey, you know what? This is what the Benjamites need to do. They send a message saying, hey, look, there's a party coming up, and basically some of our daughters will be dancing and having fun at this party. Technically, we can't give our daughters to you because we made an oath, but if you find them and kidnap them, that's your problem. If you find them and kidnap them, we'll be free from these oaths because technically we didn't give our daughters to you and you'll be able to have a wife and procreate. They organize this party and essentially these 200 Benjamite men go and steal and kidnap the women while they're dancing at a party, taking them back as their wives. Now folks, I know this is a crazy story and I tried to summarize it as quickly as I could, but the point is this. One bad decision often leads to other types of bad decisions that affect other people. Go through this story again and see how many people were negatively affected by one bad decision. Some of the Benjamite men deserved what happened to them, but most of the people in Benjamin had nothing to do with it and died in battle. The people of Jabez Gilead died too, and the women were taken from their land and given to these Benjamites. So, these other women were kidnapped by the Benjamite men, taken away from their families. This happened because of bad decisions. But here's the fifth and final lesson I want to encourage you with today. God has grace for us even in the midst of our worst decisions. Notice how the book of Judges ends. It says here that the Benjamites did this. They took the number of women they needed from the captives they had taken. They went to their own inheritance and built their cities and lived in them. At that time, each of the Israelites returned from there to his own tribe and family. Each returned from there to his own inheritance. And of course, the last verse of the book of Judges characterizes and describes the entire book of Judges, saying that in those days there was no king in Israel. Each did what seemed right to him. My friend, Although God dealt consequences to the Benjamites, He rebuilt and restored them. If there's nothing else you take from this video, I want to encourage you to understand that every decision you and I make often has consequences that can't even be measured and consequences that we can't choose.